the Canton, Ohio speech by Eugene Debs. I tried to start this before, but we're going to go ahead and start with it now. So Eugene Debs is a, uh, a popular socialist in American history. He was very popular in the turn of the century. He received one million votes while he was sitting in jail. And you could just tell when he was speaking, he just had this fire in his eyes. And he was pleading with the people, wake up, pay attention to what your government is doing for you. Um, and uh, this is back when socialism wasn't a cuss word, and we could actually talk about it um, like we have some sense, like we understand, you know, the dialogue, we understand what the word actually means. Um, and Marxist socialism couldn't even work today. So you know, for anybody to be like, you're a Marxist or some of the way, you, Mitch McConnell's a fucking socialist. Mitch McConnell wants to say, you know, Obama's a socialist and it's bullshit mill. Mitch McConnell is the earmark king. And being the earmarked king, he was able to get lots of million dollars. That's why you got the Mitch McConnell Center, uh, the Mitch McConnell Center at U of L, which is brainwashing future generations of um, conservative fucking stuck up wannabe Machiavellian principal uh, oppressors. That's what Mitch McConnell's spinning on his Mandrasa. Mitch McConnell's got a Mandrasa at U of L, so uh, yeah. So the socialism was uh, acceptable back. Uh, in the early part of American history, it was very, um, it, was a, it, was a, it was an idea, right? So it's an idea just like any other idea in the great pool of ideas. The greatest ideas should succeed. Uh, not because somebody decided, but because it's the best idea. So, so Eugene quotes, Eugene Deb quotes, I have no country to fight for. My country is the earth, and I'm a citizen of the world. And I love that. My country is earth, and I'm a citizen of the world. I am a member of humanity. So he's not a nationalist. He didn't have any type of nationalism. He says it's better to vote for what you want and not get it than to vote for what you don't get than what you don't want and get it. So it's better to vote for what you want and not get it than to vote for what you don't want and to get that. And that's true. I feel good when I vote for Nader. I walk out of a ballot box feeling like I voted for something instead of just throwing my vote away. Those who produce should have, but we know that those who produce the most, that is, those who work the hardest and the most difficult and the most menial task, have the least. So, Eugene Debs uh, gave an anti-war speech during World War I in Canton, Ohio, and Woodrow Wilson, the same guy who instituted the Federal Reserve, same person who started the fucking war, made sure America got into the war after winning the second term on a campaign promise of he kept us out of the war. So he was the peace president, got into office, and then declared the fucking war. So that's what these fucking peace candidates do all the time. Obama's doing the exact same thing. Woodrow Wilson uh, instituted the draft. He started the World War I, uh, got America's involvement into World War I. He was not the one that assassinated Archduke Ferdinand, but Woodrow Wilson was the one that got American involvement, American troops, into Europe. Uh, the Federal Reserve, and he's the one that put Eugene Debs behind jail for 10 years um, for the, I'm not sure what the act was called, but the Anti-Free Speech Act, Sedition Act, the Alien and Sedition Act, so this is just like John Adams Act, the Alien and Sedition Act, which a German had stopped and stood up for, um, you know, Zinger, John Peter Zinger, he's the one that uh, established American freedom of speech, the jurisprudence that we have. Okay, so, the Canton speech, and I'm just going to read this through because there's a lot of it, and I don't want to bullshit much longer. <laughs> so, June 16, 1918. Comrades, friends, and fellow workers, for this very cordial greeting, this very hearty reception, I thank you all with the fullest appreciation of your interest in and your devotion to the cause for which I am to speak to you this afternoon. To speak for labor, to plead the cause of the men and women and children who toil, to serve the working class who has always been to me a high privilege. It's a duty of love. I've just returned from a visit over yonder where three of our most loyal comrades are paying the penalty for their devotion to the cause of the working class. They have come to realize, as many of us have, that it is extremely dangerous to exercise the constitutional right of free speech in a country fighting to make democracy hypocrite hypocritically safe in the world. I realize in speaking to you this afternoon there are certain limitations placed upon the right of free speech. I must be exceedingly careful and prudent as to what I say and even more careful and prudent as to how I say it. 
I may not be able to say all I think, but I'm going to say anything that I do not think. But I'm not going to say anything that I do not think. I would rather a thousand times be a free soul in jail than to be a sycophant and a coward in the streets. They may put those boys in jail and some of the rest of us in jail, but they cannot put the socialist movement in jail. Those prison bars separated their bodies from ours and their souls are here this afternoon. They are simply paying the penalty that all men have paid in all the ages of history for standing erect and for seeking to pave the way to better conditions for mankind. If it had not been for the men and women who in the past have had the moral courage to go, moral courage to, go to jail, we would still be in the jungles. This assemblage is exceedingly good to look upon. I wish it were possible for me to give you what you are giving me this afternoon. What I say here amounts to very little. What I see here is exceedingly important. You workers in Ohio enlisted in the greatest cause ever organized in the interest of your class are making history today in the face of threatening opposition of all kinds. History that will be read with profound interest by coming generations. There is but one thing that you have to be concerned about and that is you keep four square with the principles of the international socialist movement. It is only when you begin to compromise that trouble begins. So far as I am concerned, it does not matter what others may say or think or do as long as I am sure that I am right with myself in the cause. There are so many who seek refuge in the popular side of the great question. As a socialist, I have long since learned how to stand alone. For the last month, I've been traveling over the Hoosier state. And let me say to you that in all my connection with the socialist movement, I have never seen such meetings, such enthusiasm with unity of purpose. Never have I seen such a promising outlook as there is today, notwithstanding the statement published repeatedly that our leaders have deserted us. Well, for myself, I have never had faith in my leaders. I'm willing to be charged with almost anything rather than to be charged with being a leader. I'm suspicious of leaders and especially of the intellectual variety. Give me the rank and file every day of the week. If you go to the city of Washington, you examine the pages of the congressional directory. You'll find that almost all these corporation lawyers and cowardly politicians, members of Congress and misrepresentatives of the masses, you will find that almost all of them claim in glowing terms that they have risen from the ranks to place places of eminence and distinction. I'm very glad that I cannot make that claim for myself. I would be ashamed to admit that I have risen from the ranks. When I rise, it will be with the ranks and not from the ranks. I will rise from my class, not above my class. When I came away from Indiana, the comrades said, when you cross the line and get over into the Buckeye State, tell the comrades there that we are on duty and doing duty. Give them for us a hearty greeting and tell them that we are going to make a record this fall that will be read around the world. The Socialists of Ohio, it appears, are very much alive this year. The party has been killed recently, which no doubt accounts for this extraordinarily extraordinary activity. There is nothing that helps the Socialist Party so much as receiving an occasional death blow. The oftener it is killed, the more active, the more energetic, the more powerful it becomes. They who have been reading the capitalist newspapers realize what a capacity they have for lying. We have been reading them lately. They know all about the Socialist Party, the Socialist Movement, except what is true. Only the other day they took an article that I had written, and most of you have read it. Most of you members of the party, at least, and they made it appear that I had undergone a marvelous transformation. I had suddenly become changed, had in fact become come to my senses, I had ceased to be a wicked socialist and become a respectable socialist, a patriotic socialist, as if I had ever been anything else. What was the purpose of this deliberate misrepresentation? It is so evident that it suggests itself. The purpose was to sow the seeds of dissension in our ranks, to have it appear that we were divided amongst ourselves and were pitted against each other to our mutual undoing. But socialists were not born yesterday. They know how to read capitalist newspapers and to believe exactly the opposite of what they read. Why should a socialist be discouraged on the eve of the greatest triumph in all the history of the socialist movement? It is true that there are anxious trying days for us all, testing days for the women and men who are upholding the banner of labor and the struggle of the working class of all the world against the exploiters of all the world, a time in which the weak and cowardly will falter and fail and desert. They lack the fiber to endure the revolutionary test. They fall away. They disappear as if they had never been. On the other hand, they are animated by the unconquerable spirit of the social revolution. They who have the moral cores to stand erect and assert their convictions, stand by them, fight for them, go to jail, to hell for them, if need be. They are writing their names in this crucial hour. They are writing their names in faceless letters in the history of mankind. Those boys over yonder, those comrades of ours, and how I love them. I, they are younger, my younger brothers. Their very names throb in my heart, thrill in my veins, and surge in my soul. I am proud of them. 
they are there for us. We are here for them. Their lips, though temporarily mute, are more eloquent than ever before, and their voice, though silent, is heard around the world. Are we opposed to Prussian militarism? Why, we have been fighting it since the day the socialist movement was born, and we're going to continue to fight it day and night until it's wiped from the face of the earth. Between us, there is no truth, truce. There is no compromise. But before I proceed along this line, let me recall a little history in which I think we are all interested. In 1869, that grand old warrior of the social, social revolution, the elder Liebnitz, Liebnitz, was arrested and sentenced to prison for three months because of his war as a socialist on the Kaiser and the Junkers that ruled Germany. In the meantime, the Franco-Prussian War broke out. Liebnitz and Babel were the socialist members in the Reichstag. They were the only two who had the courage to protest against the Alsace Lorraine from France and annexing it to Germany. And for this, they were sentenced two years to a prison fortress charged with high treason. Because even on that early day, almost 50 years ago, these leaders, these forerunners to the international socialist movement, were fighting the Kaiser and fighting the Junkers of Germany. They've continued to fight them from that day to this. The socialists have always been fighting fascism. Multiplied thousands of socialists have languished in the jails of Germany because of their heroic warfare upon the despotic ruling class of that country. Let us come down the line a little farther. You remember that at the close of Teddy Roosevelt's second term as president, he went over to Africa to make war on some of his ancestors? You remember that at the close of his expedition, he visited the capitals of Europe? And that he whined, he was whined and dined, dignified, glorified by all the kaisers and czars and emperors of the old world. He visited Potsdam while the kaiser was there, and according to the accounts published in the American newspaper, he and the kaiser were soon on the most familiar terms. They are hilariously intimate with each other, and they slapped each other on the back. So they're like best friends, right? Teddy Roosevelt and the kaiser, Teddy Roosevelt and the kaiser, those are the fascists, the people who can buddy, buddy with fascists. Eugene Debs ain't a fascist. They were hilariously intimate with each other, and they slapped each other on the back after Roosevelt had reviewed the Kaiser's troops. According to the same accounts, he became enthusiastic over the Kaiser's legions, and he said, if I had that kind of army, I could conquer the world. And so he's admiring Germany's militarism. He's admiring Prussia's militarism. Teddy Roosevelt knew the Kaiser then just as well as he knows him now. He knew that he was the Kaiser, the Beast of Berlin, and yet he permitted himself to be entertained by that Beast of Berlin, had his feet under the mahogany of the Beast of Berlin, was cheek by jowl with the Beast of Berlin, and while Roosevelt was being entertained royally by the German Kaiser, that same Kaiser was putting the leaders of the Socialist Party in jail for fighting the Kaiser and the Junkers of Germany. Roosevelt was the guest of honor in the White House of the Kaiser while the Socialists were in jails of the Kaiser for fighting the Kaiser. Who then was fighting for democracy? Teddy Roosevelt? Teddy Roosevelt, who was honored by the Kaiser? Or the socialists, who were in jail by the order of the Kaiser? Birds of a feather flocked together. When the newspapers reported that Kaiser William and ex-president Theodore recognized each other at sight, they were perfectly intimate with each other at the first touch. They made the admission that is fatal to the claim of Teddy Roosevelt, that he is the friend of the common people and champion of democracy. They admitted that they were kith and kin, that they were very much alike, and that their ideas and ideals were about the same. If Teddy Roosevelt is the great champion of democracy, the arch foe of autocracy, what business had he as the guest of honor of the Prussian Kaiser? And when he met the Kaiser and did honor to the Kaiser under the terms imputed to him, wasn't it pretty strong proof that he himself was a Kaiser at heart? Now, after being the guest of Emperor Wilhelm, the beast of Berlin, he comes back to this country and he wants to send 10 million men over there to kill, kill the Kaiser to murder his former friend and pal. That's rather queer, isn't it? And yet he is the patriot, and we the traitors. I challenge you to find a socialist anywhere on the face of the earth who is ever the guest of the beast of Berlin, except as an inmate of his prison, the elder Lipschneck, and the younger Lipschneck, the heroic son of his immortal sire. Lipschneck, L-I-E-B-K-N-E-C-H-T. A little more history along the same line. 1902, Prince Henry paid a visit to this country. Do you remember him? I do exceedingly well. Prince Henry is the brother of Emperor Willem. Emperor Willem the Kaiser. Prince Henry is another beast of Berlin, an autocrat, an aristocrat, a junker of junkers, very much despised by our American patriots. He came over here in 1902 as a representative of Kaiser William. He received by Congress and by several state legislatures, among them the state legislature of Massachusetts, then in session. 
He was invited there by the capitalist captains of that so-called Commonwealth. Massachusetts, you ain't no fucking Commonwealth. Bring it over a Kaiser. How fucking dare you, you bastards.